Hello everyone and welcome to the Bendigo Writers Festival Backstory Session. Um, I'm Jenny Mitchell and um, I would firstly want to acknowledge that I'm talking to you today on the on Wurrung country and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Pip Williams, author of The Dictionary of Lost Words. And it's a bit shiny, isn't it? But anyway. Um, uh, this is Pip's first novel, but um, she's no stranger to writing, having written, among other things, a non-fiction work as, in her role as a social researcher and also a memoir of her time in Italy with her family being a... Is it a woofer, Pip? Is that the... That's right. Yeah, it, yes, stands, yes. it stands for Willing Workers on Organic Farms. On Organic yeah. Farms, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so welcome. Um, we're not going to talk about the memoir, although I would quite like to in a way, but... <laughs> we'll stick with the Dictionary of Lost Words. Yeah. Um, you know, congratulations on writing such a rich and engaging book. Um, and I use the word rich um, advisedly because I'm foreshadowing that we won't be able to cover everything <laughs> that yeah. I might want to cover. <laughs> we can um, give it a red hot go. <laughs> we, we can give it a red hot go. Yeah. We can indeed. Um, so I actually would like to um, start by asking you about the title. So a book called The Dictionary of Lost Words is very intriguing to a word nerd such as myself, and I'm sure lots of other readers. Um, and it certainly, it, it, it sort of starts you thinking about, hang on, what, what is a lost word? You know, what's a hidden word, rejected word? So I'm just, um, and it, it sort of, it's sort of self-explanatory, but it also leads you in quite, mm. you know, in an, yeah. in an interesting way. So I'm just curious about the title. Was it the first title you thought of or? Um, it was actually. Um, okay. They, yeah. Yeah, so basically I had just been reading out of curiosity um, a wonderful non-fiction book called The Surgeon of Crowthorn, which is about the editor of the Oxford English Dictionary, James Murray, and one of the more prolific but also um, more interesting volunteers who sent in slips with examples of how words had been used. And he was a, a, a prisoner in uh, Broadmoor Prison, which was a, oh. an asylum for the criminally insane. Um, and so it was an interesting story. Uh, but in reading the story, I, I gleaned how the dictionary was compiled and put together. And it occurred to me that it was a very Victorian um, era project and it was dominated by men. So mm -hmm. all of the editors were men, all of the um, lexicographers were men, most of the assistants were men. Uh, but very importantly, all of the texts that they used to define the words of the English language, most of them were written by men because they were looking at texts that were written prior to the turn of the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, going right back to the 12th century. So mm -hmm. it occurred to me that there were probably a lot of words missing actually from their documentation of the English language, partly because they could only document words that were written down. Mm -hmm. And if you think that most of the literature and um, and manuals and textbooks and all that sort of thing, philosophy and so on, was written by men. That's one part of it. But the other part is most people were illiterate in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century. Um, and so I just assumed that there must be words that were said in places like the coal mine or the birthing room or the laundry or the kitchen um, and eventually in the trenches of World War I that weren't being written down and so therefore we're not being recorded uh, in order to be in the dictionary. Mm, okay. Yeah. And so, so what, what do you think about this? Um, Cause this it got me thinking about what is it about uh, humankind? And I'm tempted to put in brackets, white men, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> that, you know, think that, that, that it's okay to, to um, I mean, I'm talking more about now about, you know, excising words from the language. And we think about Indigenous languages in Australia, you know, people weren't even allowed to speak them. What do you, what, what do you think it is about that, yes. that people think that's an okay thing to do? Do you know what I don't think people think? I don't think they yeah. 
often yeah. actually consider it at all. And and while we're talking about, you know, the, the um, first peoples of this nation, I'd love to also acknowledge the Paramount people um, mm -hmm. who were the first people um, of the Adelaide Hills um, and also the Ghana people who were the first people of the Adelaide Plains. And I acknowledge them because a lot of the research that I did was down at the State Library of South Australia um, yeah. with the first edition Oxford English Dictionary. They have a beautiful... Um, beautiful pristine set of, of dictionaries down there, which I spent a lot of time with. Um, and for anyone who's read the book, they know that there is a, um, I do acknowledge the Ghana people um, yes. at some point in the book. And for that very reason, actually, uh, because mm. most Aboriginal languages were actively discouraged uh, when Australia was colonised. Uh, and the Ghana language is interesting because uh, there were German missionaries came out uh, soon around uh, 1820s, 1830s to South Australia. And a few of those missionaries actually collected Ghana words. So they were interested in physically recording, writing down the language of the first peoples of this place. Um, and and so they kept a record of, of Ghana language to an extent, but then um, Ghana language didn't die out, but it went quiet. Uh, it, it, it sort of, uh, Ghana people were encouraged to speak English. They were not encouraged to speak their own language. And today there is a revival of Ghana language and that's because their words were written down. Now there's some controversy over how some words should be pronounced, how they should be spelt, all of that, because yes. it is a language that is being dug up, much like we might dig up an archaeological site. Um, mm. So it has to be understood anew, um, but it is just an example of how language is discouraged and then uh, we understand the importance of words in explaining who we are as a culture. And, and I'm, I'm talking about um, in my book, I'm interested in women and working class people, I suppose, and the words that they might use and the meanings they might ascribe to words that are in the dictionary, but their meanings might not be included. Um, mm. But in terms of indigenous peoples around the world, their, their historical language um, helps them to understand their culture, their kin, their relationship to country, all of those things. And we don't have English words that are adequate um, yeah. to explain those things. And so, mm. of course, you're diminished if you can't use your language to some extent. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. So we'll talk a little bit more about language and its limitations because I'm really interested in that. But um, I am um, just kind of working my way from the title through. Yeah. Um, there was... <laughs> I did read there was a lot of pre-publication excitement about the book and uh, I was sort of wondering, you know, what that was like to know that the book was going to be published and then um, to find out that there was even a bidding war going on. You know, some people would, I mean, I think a lot of writers, that, that would be the ultimate dream, really. And I just wondered, what was that like for you to, um, yeah. Oh, you know, um, kind of surreal. Uh, mm. You do as a writer, you know, there are so many writers listening to this probably. Um, and mm. I can assure you six, well, you know, three years ago, I was an unpublished creative writer. And, you know, my biggest dream in the world would be to publish a book. And I, and I got my travel memoir published. And that really was the, one of the best days of my life. Mm. Um, when I started writing this novel, I have to admit, Jenny, and I hope this doesn't, you know, I'm trying not to be immodest, but the, I, I knew the idea was good. Yeah. I didn't know whether I would be able to write it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was an idea that I thought had legs and I was really excited about it. And it actually um, made the writing of it so, so enjoyable because I was really interested in exploring this um, idea yeah. of, of language and how it's defined and who defines it and so on. And so I really enjoyed the process. So I knew I had a good idea, but wasn't sure whether or not I was the right person to write it. Yeah. Um, and so I was absolutely thrilled when a firm press decided that it was worth publishing. And then the interest that the book got from overseas was just surreal. I didn't expect that. I, I hoped that it would be 
published in the UK. And I think I said that to the publisher at a firm press, you know, that my dream for this book is that it's published in England because it is an English story, yeah. but it is also the story of the English language, which is actually quite an international story. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my big dream. I didn't dream as big as, you know, international yeah. <laughs> yeah. sort of publishing bidding wars. That wasn't yeah. part of my... <laughs> you wouldn't dare, would you? you no, know? no, yeah, right. no. Yeah. One, one thing at a time, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah, just get published first. Yeah. Well, so that was all fabulous. And then, you know, there would have been a launch planned and a book <laughs> tour. Yeah. And, you know, then the pandemic, all the shiny plans fell away. Um, so, you know, how did you manage that? And were, were there any, actually any silver linings in... Um, in that yeah that's such a lovely question the launch was planned for the mortlock library down at the um state library of south australia which if you don't know the mortlock library it's like a harry potter library it is mm. beautiful it's it's very old it's um stacked with um old books it's stunning um so i was really looking forward to that and that was planned for <laughs> i think it was three days after we went into lockdown and so that got cancelled um every single event that had been planned got cancelled and I was planning events around the country. Um, so essentially what happened is um, I had been worrying about my, my carbon footprint to be frank and yeah. we had started, because I, I live on five acres and I'd started calculating how many trees I would have to plant in order to, <laughs> in order to sort of make up for all of my, yeah. my miles, air miles. Um, so one of the silver linings is I haven't had to plant a single tree, um, which is good because I'm <laughs> yeah. not the gardener in the family. Yeah. Um, and, and the other silver lining is that, so everything went online. So all of these um, events that we planned at libraries, regional libraries and, you know, city libraries and, and other places, we had to quickly um, change that itinerary to an online itinerary. Mm. And although I don't get to sort of see people in the flesh, I don't get to talk to them, um, you know, in the same room, I realized that what happened was a lot of people who wouldn't be able to attend something in person were able to attend online. And yeah. so for instance, the first couple of events that I had in that first week, more than 200 people turned up to the mm. online event in mm. real time. I wouldn't have got 20 or 30 people mm. to that same event um, face to face. And so yeah. I feel like that's the silver lining, not just for me, but for um, people who are interested in talking to authors or finding out about books who might not physically be able to make it to their library, who they, they might be remote uh, mm. and they don't actually have a local library. Um, and I do feel like uh, it opened up access in some ways for a lot of people. And mm. that's been really fabulous. Yes, I'd really agree with that. I've been to some really interesting events um, yes. that I would not have you know, necessarily gone to. One day, quite early on, I went to the New York Opera. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, same. <laughs> you know, sat in my lounge room. I didn't have to pay for it, but yeah. I didn't have to stay up late and I didn't have to get dressed up. It was great. So <laughs> I, and I, do, I do think that I do think that's a silver lining. And one of the issues I suppose is going to be um, how those things are funded in the longer term if they continue, you know, mm. but anyway, yes. that's, that's a bit of an aside, but I know you've been a social researcher, so you're probably quite interested. In that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I read that um, I'm sort of interested in the impetus for the book and I read that you started by wondering and I quote whether words mean, mean different things to men and women and if they do is it possible that we've lost something in the process of defining them um, so was there a particular I don't know experience or event or something that happened that led you to those questions well, it was reading that book in the first oh, place yes. and realising yes. that, um, you know, the, the language we, or, you know, the, the evidence we were using for mm. what words meant was, was textual evidence. But in mm. fact, most of the time we use words verbally, not textually, particularly mm. prior to the 20th century. And so as a social researcher, I, what I actually was picking up on is that the, um, the methodology was flawed fundamentally flawed. Mm -hmm. However, 
Um, having said that, you asked a question earlier about why, do, you know, in a way, why do we choose to ignore words that might be spoken by different classes of people, different genders, different, different races of people. It's my belief that that choice, that choice wasn't actually made. Um, like so many things, there's sort of institutional um, racism, there's institutional gender bias, there's institutional mm. class bias, and we don't notice it. Mm. And of course, that's what was happening back in 1875 when they started this project. Um, and, you know, because we still have those issues today, I think we have to, um, we have to see it in context. And, and I hope I've done that in my book. My book wasn't, I'd never intended to sort of turn it into a, um, in a way, a, a, a sort of blame, blaming of anyone in particular. Um, I think it was a system that existed at the time that everybody was um, entrenched in. And uh, my character, I suppose, um, she realises the flaws in the system. And that's what the book is about. Yes. Um, yeah. But whether that system could have could have been um, manipulated at the time in a different way so that it was fairer, I'm not sure. It would have required mm. more than lexicographers to create a dictionary that included the words of women and and people who are illiterate. It mm. would have required sociologists as well. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I, and I, um, just to comment, I, I certainly don't see the book as a, there's no blame in it. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's a show, you know, it's that adage really show don't tell. Yeah. So it's, and Esme, um, who I would like to talk about now a little bit is, um, is just a lovely, um, she's just a great character. She's oh, such a, um, she's so strong and she's so curious and she's had um, such an interesting and, and, and a very liberal upbringing for that time, which I think is, you know, underpins a lot of what she's doing. Plus, um, being exposed to the, the, the compiling of the dictionary and, mm -hmm. um, and all, all the other lexicographers, including her father. Um, and so she's a word collector, a word collector from a young age. Mm. And um, she certainly quite early on starts to ask those questions about why this word and, you know, why not that word and why are some of those slips put, you know, where they're not going to get into the dictionary and some make it into the right pigeonhole. Um, and there's also, you know, I said before, it's a rich book. It covers a hundred years. Um, and it covers things like, um, well, obviously the development of language, but, you know, girls' education, gender roles, class, the suffragette movement, the war. Um, and I think um, that's the First World War. And I think, um, I think you're right. It, 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 it would have taken almost to be in a different time of developing the dictionary as well, you know, that um, because all of those things, you know, class and gender and all of those things were not as examined or as um had, had had you know was still in a, in a place they hadn't got to say where we are today yeah that's Look. right and actually okay. i think it's a jenny i think it's a continuum um mm. one of it's interesting one or two people have said um and i think this is a, often a, a criticism leveled at historical fiction when there are characters doing or saying something that really reflects the modern day um, woman rather than the woman from 1910 or 1914 or whatever. But I find this a really interesting criticism because I sometimes think, I think we're forgetting what the women of 19, 1880 to 1928 in the UK were doing. They were far, it, many of them were far more radical than we um, than we would think of them today. We wouldn't yep. have the vote if it wasn't for those women. So they were radically feminist, some of them. Um, mm -hmm. And if they weren't, women would not have got um, equal rights to vote and to stand mm -hmm. for parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we sometimes misunderstand uh, older generations um, and other eras uh, because we look at their kind of high necked blouses and long skirts uh, and think that they were um, the suppressed, voiceless uh, people in private, that they were, that their 
presented as in public. Mm. Mm. Whereas in fact, if they weren't as radical as they were, if they weren't willing to march and, and for some of these women, if they weren't willing to smash windows and blow up letterboxes yeah. and go to prison and starve yeah. themselves, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so to think that those same women wouldn't maybe be talking about sex or having sex um, or, you know, this, that and the other, I, you know, I often find a little naive um, and, and probably just buying into cliches that we've, we've seen mm -hmm. and, and read through, you know, other historical creative fictions. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm going off track now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because I think, I mean, you're right. And we, um, I mean, all along the way, a woman or, or say, we'll just use women at the moment, you know, is born who says, hang on, I don't, yes. this isn't right. You know, yes, and it happens. So, yeah, yes. it's always happened or we wouldn't be anywhere. Um, That's and, right. and, and, and also men are born who go, gosh, you know, I wonder if we could do this or I wonder if we could do that. And, and yeah. so, you know, we do, we do move along. Yes. And so I think um, I, I, I'm ashamed to admit <laughs> I was quite surprised. I had to sort of, you know, pull myself back a bit because I thought Esme was going to school. Oh, yeah, I guess, I guess, <laughs> you know, I guess that's, a, you know, it was sort of like... Um, in fact, by law, she had to. So yeah, by that so, stage, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so children had to be educated, including girls, um, yes, to about yeah. the age of 14. So, yes. yeah. so that was a learning. Well, it was a reminder. Really. I, probably <laughs> yeah. didn't, I probably did not know. But, yeah. um, so, you know, all of these questions that we're talking about, you could have um, put on your social researcher hat and, and you know, written it as a, a non-fiction, but you chose to write a novel what was what was that um... oh actually I, no I never ever ever considered doing this right. as a fiction. so um yeah so I'm a, a social scientist um by you know by education and by profession but uh to be honest I'd given up research I gave up research about six years ago eight years ago and had been working in other areas but um I'm not a historian so I would not um have pretended to be able to do this sort of historical research to, with the academic rigor of, of a historian. I think if you want that sort of commentary, read Claire Wright's books. Um, yes. she, she has um, written uh, incredible books around women's lives, women's suffrage, all, all of these sorts of issues with a rigor that I, I haven't employed in writing this novel. However, it was very important to me to, to write the history as accurately as I could. So um, even though it's fiction, I, I was dedicated to trying to get the history, uh, the facts correct in terms of when things happened, what words were published at what time. Um, so all of the words in the book are real words, all of the definitions I give are real definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary, but also the timelines, the people involved, all of those things. It was important to me that um, that aspect of it, because it would be new to many people, was as accurate as possible to the historical record. Um, because like me, a lot of people probably read fiction to understand history. And so I do feel like that there is a, an obligation to some extent um, to, to be, uh, I suppose, truthful in two ways. Truthful to the facts that you know, but also truthful to the story that is missing in history, in the historical record. And that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to tell a story that hadn't been told. I was mm. trying to um, understand what happens between the lines and in the white space of the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, I was trying to give a, I suppose, a voice and a story to women who I knew existed actually, but had very little uh, written about them in the historical record. So one of my characters uh, is Dita. Dita is Esme's uh, godmother in this story. Uh, her real name is Edith Thompson, and I use that name as well in the book. Um, she's a real woman who was involved in the dictionary right from the letter A to the letter Z. She was a volunteer, but also um, given a lot of editorial work because she was so highly valued. But if you look her up online, you'll find less than a paragraph written mm -hmm. about her. 
and I just didn't understand why I knew so much about the men involved in the Oxford English Dictionary and so little about this woman who was involved throughout the entire project. And I had a bit of a dilemma actually when I talked about, you know, I want to be truth, I want to be, um, uh, acknowledge the facts of the history. My dilemma was how do I, how do I include this woman without making her up, without being um, dishonest in a way, without not sticking to the facts of the history. And my solution to that was to give her the nickname Dita um, whenever she's kind of in a, a scene or in correspondence with Esme. But when she's in, when she's acting in her role as a volunteer for the dictionary, I give her the name Edith Thompson, so, um, which was her name. So when mm. she's doing something that I know she did, um, that's how I solve that problem and i also am very clear in the back of the book what's what's fiction and what's not yeah. Yeah. um because i i think as a reader you value that you you want to know mm. what you can kind of talk about as fact and what you can yes. talk about as um not fiction so much but maybe a social you know the, the sort of social assumptions that you might make take yeah. from fiction yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Dita or Edith, Edith and her sister Elizabeth were a good example of what we were talking about before um, in the sense that, I can't remember, it was, I think it was their grandparents that left them their house in Bath so that they wouldn't have to marry. Yes. Now, yeah. you know, yeah. you would say, did that happen? Well, it did happen, you know, but it's a sort of a, it's one of those examples, isn't it, of the things yeah. that were happening and and that's the way right. that some people were thinking and um, that's right and that's a great example actually of um of a, a, an example of a group of people who actually had very modern very forward thinking um ideas and behaviors so mm. in real life edith and elizabeth's uh, grandfather was a parliamentarian um and he in fact was um a a great advocate for universal suffrage back in the 1830s, 40s, 50s. Now, universal suffrage is an interesting term because it doesn't include women. It, clu yeah. it includes men of all, you know, all men over 21, uh, regardless of property, race, um, or education. So that's what universal suffrage meant. And that was the big um, fight in terms of politics for you know many hundreds of years in the mm. in the uk um women's suffrage is didn't sort of you know didn't factor into the argument for universal suffrage but in fact their grandfather did make a, an argument for women's suffrage as well mm. Mm. and so i know that edith and elizabeth would have had quite modern um forward thinking ideas based on that family heritage if mm. you like and so mm. she became the perfect um uh, mentor if you like for for my character yeah, esme. Right. Yeah. and you were able to give the time that esme spends in bath you know you were able to um see her, her show us esme's horizons being expanded by um those afternoon teas <laughs> that were you know yeah. where politics was discussed and yeah. i think sex was discussed you know yeah. there was a whole heap of stuff yeah, yeah. and well, i think that's the other sorry jenny i, was yeah, just, no, I think that's no. the other thing we forget that women's suffrage was something that a lot of men wanted yeah um and and a lot of men were um supportive of of women's fight mm. for the vote and for more for for um representation in parliament as well um mm. and i think we forget that you know it, it isn't women against men in mm. all of these arguments um a lot of men understood that things would be better if women were sitting around the table helping to make decisions yeah yeah that's right um well that's good i was going to ask you about how you manage that interweaving of fiction and history but you've, you've you know you've talked about that really with um with with the data um what about your uh fictional characters because writers often talk about um you know having almost a relationship with a fictional character mm -hmm. and sometimes uh they feel as though it's the character that's kind of leading the the storyline and i was just wondering if it was like that for you are you one of those sort of writers or you know how do you kind of develop your characters do you enjoy yeah. that um 
Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, I have to admit, I kind of, I was talking to somebody at the gym about this this morning, actually, <laughs> also a writer. Um, yeah. And we were talking about whether we're people who just start at the beginning and just write and see what happens or whether we're planners. I do plan. I have a, in fact, it's just how my brain works. Um, and it possibly is a research brain, a planner brain. That's, this is how I've always functioned. I, I very quickly see the big picture. And so I have an idea of, of what is going to happen in the story. But I think the thing that's most important to me are the themes of the story. So it's the question that I start with that is important um, in the first instance. So in, in this book, it was, um, you know, do words mean different things to men and women? And if so, what? Mm. And that is the theme, the question that really led everything. And so for me to answer that question, I needed a character. I needed to throw a woman into the crucible of the scriptorium, uh, which is where yeah. all of the words were being defined. And I needed to see what would happen. So it was an experiment, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so I threw a little girl in and then I just imagined what a little girl would be doing in this scriptorium, um, how she would interpret what the what her father and all of the men are doing, what she would do with a slip of paper if it fell into her lap um, and before she could quite read it, mm -hmm. uh, all of those things. And then as she grows, so I have an idea of this character, but she really does develop um, in my mind as I'm writing her. Um, right. yep. Something, I mean, you, you talked about her as a really strong character and so on. One thing I, I deliberately did is I didn't want to make her the suffragette. I didn't want to make her the extraordinary yeah. person. In some ways, she did have a, I mean, in all ways, she had a very unconventional upbringing because she, her father was widowed and he chose to continue caring for her. That's the unconventional bit. She didn't have a mother. Um, and she had a working father. So, uh, but, but on the other hand, she's not a radical herself. No. She certainly makes friends with um, one woman in particular who is a suffragette. Um, but I didn't want her to be a hero in that way, an historical hero. I wanted her in a way to be um, an every woman. So, mm. you know, she could be you or me or, or anybody else that reads mm. Book could have could have had her life it's middle yeah. class um, except for the unconventional upbringing it's it's ordinary otherwise and mm -hmm. so she struggled with some of the things that an ordinary woman would struggle with as she was growing up mm -hmm. she wasn't as brave as her friend Tilda for instance or she no. didn't think she was yeah. um, and I thought it was important to um, have a character that uh, I could relate to in the, in the first instance and that maybe readers could relate to as well. Yeah. And I kept coming across this one anecdote over and over again, which is that one word was lost from the Oxford English Dictionary. And that word was the word bond maid. And bond maid means a slave girl, a bonded servant. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the only word that James Murray, the editor, will admit was lost accidentally. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and you, you notice my dictionary yeah. here. Yeah. I'll just pick it up where you want to see. This, this is actually um, a first edition Oxford English Dictionary, A to B. Mm -hmm. And if I open it to the right page where bondmaid should be, I can guarantee you, because I've done this many times, yeah. it's not there. Yeah, and it's true. And, yeah. and James Murray was sent a letter by a member of the public complaining about um, the fact that this word wasn't in the dictionary. And apparently, you know, he, he was furious and so on. And, and letters were sent to and from the um, various people funding the, the, the dictionary um, and, you know, asking how this mistake could have been made. Um, and the truth is no one knows. No one knows how this word was lost. Um, but when you understand the process of how the words ended up in print form in this dictionary, it's inevitable that words got lost because mm. words were physical entities. They were written on little slips of paper about this big uh, with the word at the top and an example of use. 
and um, sort of quotation from a book or a journal or something and, and, the, um, and the details of where it came from. And then those slips were sorted in the scriptorium into chronological order. Um, and then a lexicographer would write a top slip which would give the, gen the sort of uh, root definition of the word or the, the main definition of the word. And then the slips were just put in the order that they needed to be typeset for mm. the dictionary. Yeah. And they were tied with string. <laughs> it's a wonder stuff. it ever got done at all. That's right. And <laughs> taken from the scriptorium, which is in Oxford, to the Oxford University Press, which is in Jericho, which is maybe a 10 minute bicycle ride. And by bicycle, you know. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. By bicycle. Yeah. Um, and so they and then they're given to, to the typesetter, the compositor, and the compositor sits them on his, on his bench mm -hmm. in a pile of slips. There are so many ways that this pile of slips could get blown off the bench and a, a slip could get, you know be lost or that you know there are so many places where these slips yeah. could yeah. end up um in a you know just falling between the floorboards or mm. into some nook or cranny in yes. some room um and in my book i i have because no one knows how the word was lost mm. i took that as um permission to make it yeah. up and esme esme is uh crucial to the loss of that particular word. Yeah. Uh, Esme makes quite a few discoveries about the limitations of language. Um, and uh, there are a few examples of those and I'll, I'll leave some out because of time. But um, I, I, found, I found this this little part in the book quite poignant. So when, when she first, so she's, her, she and her father have always, um, words that's how they deal with life really it's all about words and you know you go and look in the dictionary if you want to find something out so when she starts menstruating her dad points her to the dictionary and she finds like so many girls before and after um all only really negative you know pejorative words to describe this this momentous thing that's happened to her and so she muses, not one of them could explain fully what had happened to me, not one. And I, there, are, there are a couple of other, there are sort of moments of, um, I suppose, disillusionment, disillusionment for, for, um, for Esme, because that's, words are really her joy and her solace. And, but then there are these times when they fail her or, you know, I don't know if you want to sort of say oh, about yeah. that. I mean, that was yeah. very... For me, that was a very important part of the book. Mm. Is that um, yes, because she, her father is a single father, and and they do function very well. This father and daughter through mm. the medium of words, mm. and particularly the words in the scriptorium and the and the developing dictionary. Mm. And um, whenever he wants to explain something to her, he 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 um, defaults to the definitions mm -hmm. um, and so she has has also tended to do this as well and as she grows she just starts to realize that the words or the definitions are inadequate to mm -hmm. actually explain things to her things that are um, happening to her things that she's slowly beginning to question or be interested mm -hmm. in um, and so there's a few aspects to that first that um, the meanings are inadequate because they've been chosen, you know, defined by people who couldn't possibly mm. understand or be interested in her experience. So none of the men have ever been an adolescent girl who gets a period <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> um, and, and so the definitions that she finds are very complicated. They're very, um, in fact, they don't actually use any of the words that people are using around her, mm. like a curse or, you know, bleeding or any of those words. None of those words explain menstruation mm. in the, Oxford, the first Oxford English Dictionary. And in mm. fact, the words that are used are completely um, foreign, you know, mm. foreign to us as well. So the word that was, um, that was used to explain menstruation was a word called catamenia. Um, I had never heard of it before <laughs> and it's almost like it's almost like um, men are so 
the men who were developing the dictionary were so kind of frightened of some of these words, perhaps, mm. that they could only define them in very um, objective medical ways. Um, I looked up the word clitoris, for example, mm. and um, the way it's defined is with reference to um, with reference to other biological animals. So it doesn't talk about women at all. Um, and it uses really strange language mm. to define this part of the body in a mm. way that cannot be linked to the human female. <laughs> um, and of course, there is nothing about orgasms or pleasure, you know, linked no. to this particular <laughs> organ. Um, and so things like that, you know, she mm. starts to realise that uh, the words are inadequate. But there's another mm. element to that as well. So she ad words are so important to her. They never... They never stop being important. She never becomes disillusioned with words. She just becomes disillusioned with uh, the way they've been defined, which yeah. is what sets her on a path to yes. collecting women's words. Mm. But there is another aspect to it. And I know this because it was important to me, and, but some readers may not. At, at very important moments in her life, words are so inadequate that they're not used at mm -hmm. all. Now it's a subtle thing, but it was important to me that there are times in Esme's life um, where nothing really can mm -hmm. um, match the experience. And, and so there's silence. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. sometimes I think in real life, that's the, you know, that's the truth of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we actually don't have words for some things. Yeah, yeah. And we can honour that emotion or that experience sometimes best through silence. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. And I, I, I did pick that up, that, yeah. Um, oh, I'm glad. It was because, <laughs> because some, you know, pretty tough things happen to young Esme. She, <laughs> and, you know, and she has to work with that. Um, so by, by contrasting, um, you know, that, that talk of menstruation and all those words that, you know, were a bit um, too difficult to define um, in any real way, um, I love the word morbs. <laughs> oh, so do I. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. So, um, so just for a bit of context, morbs is used by Mabel in the covered market and uh, um, so she says, to, Esme had been through a bad time. She says to Esme, I heard you got the morbs. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and, then, and then Mabel defines the morbs in such a, well, she talks about it as a coming and going sadness. And then yes. she, she says, you know, I got the morbs, you got the morbs, Lizzie's got the morbs. And it just, I think it was, it's such, it, it's a women's word. I mean, it might not be, but, you know, the way that it was described and defined came out of women's experience. And I, I just really like that. Yeah. So where did you find the word morbs? Um, yeah, well, this is actually a really great question because, um, again, one of the things I didn't want to do was make up any words. Mm -hmm. So the words um, from the dictionary are real words, but all of the words that Esme collects, which were not in the dictionary, are real words as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, the only way I can um, find words that were left out of the dictionary is by looking at, um, at slang dictionaries. And mm -hmm. because slang... And this is another interesting thing, and I, you know, I have thought about it to a certain extent, but I'm sure, I'm sure lexicographers and philologists, people who, who study words, mm. would have a lot more to say about this. But I have a sense that slang words were left out of the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, slang is used on the whole by lower classes of people who, who in my opinion, um, find the proper English words inadequate and they change them um, to suit their own circumstances, to suit their own vernacular, to suit their own, um, you know, occupations and so on. Um, now, these words were left out of the, of the dictionary and therefore the official record of the English language because they were seen as distasteful or, um, or not real in a way. And often they're not written down. Uh, but these days they are written down. Mm. And in fact, many of them are in the Oxford English Dictionary now. Um, yeah. And so 
what I had to do in terms of including words that weren't originally in the dictionary was turn to slang and, and try to work out, well, what might have been used by different people and why? And so which words am I going to include in this particular story? I, allu I, I include, you know, a good handful of mm -hmm. words that I know did exist at that time, but weren't in the dictionary. But really, the truth is, I don't know what words have been lost. To no. Yeah. Uh, none of us do, because no. they weren't written down. So they mm. weren't written down as slang either. And I, yeah. I am pretty sure that there would be a whole lot of words that have just fallen out of memory. Mm. And because they were never written down by anybody, and because maybe they were transient, a little bit transient, and so they haven't been recalled through the generations, we don't know what they are, just like we don't know, um, just like the Ghana people don't know mm. many of the words that their ancestors used because mm. they weren't the words that those German missionaries wrote down and mm. because their more recent ancestors weren't allowed to use them. Um, and so I had to just allude to the fact mm. that mm. they existed and that many of them are in, you know, Esme's dictionary that she's yes. developing. Phillips, um, that's right. Yes. That's why I don't have a huge long list of of missing of lost words because mm. I, I simply don't know what they are. Thank you so much for lovely, you know, generous, warm responses. It's been great. Oh, thank you. Really enjoyed it's been it. such a delight. Yeah. And also, mm. can I just uh, do a call out to everyone in Bendigo, but all throughout Virginia. Victoria? Yes. Um, you know, I'm in South Australia and, and we've got it easy, but we're so grateful to, mm. you know, the hard yards that you're all doing right mm. now, which mm. are just for everybody really. And um, you're all, you know, you're all heroes mm. uh, for sticking to it. So um, thank you. And I hope that, you know, there's so much stuff online that can keep you interested, <laughs> you know, when you're locked in the house for 22 hours a day that you have to be locked <laughs> in the house. Yeah, so um, yeah, go true. well, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And may we all come safely through this. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, yeah.